Good morning. My name is Myra Benson, and I am here with Nadine Arroyo. Today is June 30th, and we are at Tread of the Pioneers Museum. Um, I wanted to get your verbal consent that you've read and signed the Tread of the Pioneers oral history legal release, which allows us to make this collection recording and save the interview for access by researchers and staff. Nadine, do you agree? I do. Thank I you. Have. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Nadine. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, like she said, I'm Nadine Arroyo, and what I'd like to do today is I would like to give you an idea of um, the Utter family history and how they got to Route County. So I'm going to give you a little bit about the Utter family heritage. First off, the Utter family was originally from Tracy, Iowa and they farmed there for many years. In fact, my grandpa was born there, and my grandma was born in Illinois. Now, her family moved from Illinois to Iowa, and I'm not sure what year that was, but in the process, she met my grandpa, and they fell in love. And they were married in Tracy, Iowa, in the year of 1886. Now Grandpa's occupation when they first got married was he was a farmer and he farmed the land that my grandmother's parents owned and they raised a lot of grain crops and he also had uh, a number of pigs. He raised hogs. But one of the other things that Grandpa did was he worked in road construction. He worked for the highway department. And he helped build a lot of the roads around Tracy, Iowa. But work ran out. And so he was transferred by the road department to Pond Creek, Oklahoma. And so in the fall of 1900, the family left Tracy, Iowa and they left Tracy, Iowa after the crops had all been harvested and Grandpa actually sold the pigs so he'd have a little money to travel on. And when they left Tracy, Iowa, they left with two covered wagons, two teams of horses, a mule, and seven kids and some supplies and some possessions that they wanted to bring with them. Well, believe it or not, my grandma was pregnant with my dad when they left Tracy, Iowa. And my dad was born February the 25th, 1901 in Pond Creek, Oklahoma. He was the eighth kid in that family. Grandpa worked with the highway department around Pond Creek, Oklahoma all of the summer of 1901. And then work ran out. He built bridges mainly, and so his work ran out. And oh boy, what were they gonna do now? So he and grandma got together and they decided they were gonna come west. And one of the reasons for that is because grandpa had a relative that was already out here in the west and he kept sending back stories about the wide open frontier and how beautiful it was out here and the and the rivers and how much grass there was and how beautiful it was and that really caught grandpa's ear so he decided he was going to go west they were going to come west had no idea where they were going but they were going to go west so once again they left pond creek oklahoma with two covered wagons, two teams of horses, a mule, some supplies, their possessions, and now eight kids. They came on west and they arrived in Denver in midwinter. So when they got to Denver, 
there was too much snow on the wagon roads to come on up over the passes. So they lived in an apartment in Denver that first winter and grandpa got a job in a livery stable. Now that's where you take care of horses and in those days that was the main mode of travel was by horse either by carriage, sled, wagon, whatever. But the main mode of travel was with horses. <clears throat> Denver was just a small little town at that time. Very few buildings, not many people. But while they were in Denver, Grandpa heard about this great place of Steamboat Springs. And when he was in Iowa, he had done some reading about the Homestead Act, which had been passed, that what the Homestead Act allowed was a lot of the land that was out in the West was all government owned. And the government wanted to put it into some kind of production. And so they passed the Homestead Act, and what that was passed for was to allow people to go into the land title office, lay claim to 160 acres, at first it was 160 acres, and all they required was that you had to turn that land into some kind of agricultural use, and you had to live on the land, and you had to do that for five years before you could get title to it or get a deed to it. He heard that Steamboat was be, being settled by a few people, but there, that there were still homesteads available. So after the snow melted and they were able to start traveling again, coming west, they left Denver again, two covered wagons, two teams of horses, the mule, and now eight kids. Now these wagons weren't very big. The wagons are approximately four feet wide and they're 12 feet long. So that means each one of them had about 48 square feet. But those wagons were packed full of their supplies and their belongings. And one of the things that is so interesting and intriguing to me is that when my grandmother left Tracy, Iowa, she had a china cabinet and it was one of these old china cabinets that has the barrels down on the bottom it's like a half barrel that's been cut in half and it's the bottom drawers and uh, then the top of it has two glass doors and shelves where you put your dishes well she wasn't about to leave that behind and so that came with them and lo and behold, I own that cabinet today. I still have that cabinet. And after I got it, I refinished it and um, I stripped it. And there were about six coats of paint on that cabinet before I ever got down to the natural wood. But it is an absolutely beautiful piece of furniture now and I cherish it dearly. It was a hard trip when they came. The adults and the kids that were old enough to walk, they walked most of the way. But there was still a lot of snow on the wagon trails. So it was not an easy trip. There just wasn't any roads. It was just trails that had been made by the wagons that had come before them. And in cases where they came to a steep hill, they would have to unhitch a team of horses from one wagon, put two teams on a wagon, and pull that wagon up the hill. And then unhitch the two teams, take it back, and go get the other wagon and pull it up. So they only brought one wagon up at a time. The one good thing that was about their trip is that game and wildlife was plentiful and the fishing was good. 
So they had, uh, they had a lot of good meat to eat on the way. Well, they came on towards Steamboat and they arrived in Steamboat on June the 2nd of 1902. And when they first got here, they camped down along the Yampa River and Steamboat was a very small little town, had very few buildings. But in the time that they camped along the river, they stayed there about five days. Grandpa went into the land title office to make application for 160 acres. And what he really wanted to do was he wanted to be down along the Yampa River. He wanted to have some acreage along the river. But by the time he made application, that had already been all homesteaded. So he got as close as he possibly could and he settled in the Cow Creek area. And that's where the ranch still is today. He made application for the land. He was granted that application. And so out they went to start a new adventure. They went out to the 160 acres and uh, the first summer they lived mainly in a tent, but they started clearing the land. And the land was covered with brush and trees. So it was really a hard job. It's a lot of grubbing. They did a lot of grubbing with grubbing hose. So they uh, cleared some land, but one of the first things they did was they dug a cellar in the side of a hill. And this cellar was interesting because you could get to it from the outside or that summer they cut logs off of the property and they built a two cabin or a two room cabin next to that cellar. So you could get to the cellar from inside the house as well. And that cellar actually served as refrigeration because it was nice and cool in there. So they built the two room cabin that first year. They also built a small barn where they could get the, the horses and that mule uh, some shelter. And they dug a, a water well. And in those days, water was pretty plentiful, so they didn't have to go very far to find water. And again, they lived mainly off of wild game and fish. They did some fishing on the Yampa River. But Grandma also was able to plant a few potatoes in that fertile land that they had just cleared. And the land was so fertile that the potatoes did great. So that first year they had wild game, fish, and some potatoes. And that's how they survived. But every year after that they cleared more land and they eventually started planting grain and hay. They planted grasses so they could cut hay. So they would have some hay for the animals. And they started planting more potatoes because they did so well. Grandma always managed to have a large garden too. So she had vegetables that she grew in her garden and they kept them in that cellar. But she had a large garden, my mom had a large garden, and I today have a large garden. As years went by, my grandpa bought some more stock. He bought some beef cattle, bought some milk cows. They had a few chickens. So life was looking good. They were pretty much self-sufficient. But during that time, believe it or not, two more brothers were born, which made a total of 10 kids. But within that five year period, my grandpa and the kids were able to prove up on the land, to clear it, to use it for agricultural purposes. 
and um, he met all of the conditions under the Homestead Act. So he went in to lay claim to it. And the one thing that I thought was very interesting when I was doing some research on the Homestead Act is that in the United States, with all the applications that were applied for under the Homestead Act, only about 50% of them were ever approved upon. People just didn't meet the requirements that they needed to in order to get title to the land. But my grandparents, thank goodness, they accepted the frontier conditions and they endorsed it and they were able to get title to that first 160 acres. But over the years, more land became available that my grandpa was able to purchase. So he bought land along with his 160 acres. In fact, at one time he had nearly 2,000 acres out there that he had bought and had acquired under the Homestead Act. Now they lived in that small house for about 17 years. And when the kids got old enough, the older kids got old enough to go to school, they went to the Sydney School, which is still standing today. It's a residence now, but it's still there. And it was the closest one to the ranch. They went five years to that school. But then they built the Hilton Gulch School and they started going to the Hilton Gulch School, which was only about two miles away. There weren't many roads and the roads were not good and they definitely weren't plowed in the winter. So you only went to town when you absolutely had to. And when you went, you went with a team of horses and a sled. And I'm dating myself, but I remember doing that. <clears throat> there also was no mail. There was no mail routes. So whenever anyone went to town, they'd go to the post office and pick up everybody's mail. And when they got back home, they'd go and distribute all of the mail out to the various neighbors. Now the kids went to the Sydney schoolhouse to start with, and they rode that old mule that they had brought from Iowa. And Grandpa had bought another horse by that time. So they had a horse and a mule that they rode to, um, to school. And that mule turned out to be the pride of all of the kids at the school. They loved that mule. But he was getting older and he got lame and he had a hard time getting around. So grandpa decided he was gonna sell him. He's gonna get rid of him. So there was an, an, a gentleman here in town by the name of Bill McCausland. I still remember him, believe it or not. But Bill McCausland was a fur trader and he did a lot of trapping. And so what he would do is he would go around and with these animals that could hardly get around or um, were old, he'd buy them up and he'd use them for bait for his foxes and his coyotes. And um, so grandpa was gonna sell his mule to Bill McCausland which he did, and Grandma was very distraught. She was really unhappy with that, and so were the kids, because they loved that old mule. And Grandma gave him strict orders, Bill McCausland, before he ever left. She said, don't you dare shoot that mule, because those kids loved that mule. And she told him about how they used to ride it to school, and he had come all the way from Iowa with them, and uh, she didn't want him used for coyote bait. Well, he went ahead and took the mule, but he never did shoot him. He never shot that mule. And wouldn't you know it, about three weeks later, the mule comes back to the ranch. He returned to the ranch. Of course, the kids and grandma were exceptionally happy Grandpa bought the mule back from Bill of McCausland, and the mule was allowed to live on the ranch and it lived to be a very old age. In fact, it outlived all of the horses that they had brought from Iowa. 
But as my grandma said, I guess the coyotes got him in the end anyway. But at least he was able to live a good long life. Now besides ranching, my grandpa used to haul freight. And he hauled freight from Walker to Steamboat. They had a regular wagon that they used, a couple of teams of horses. And he used to go down once or twice a week and pick up freight from uh, Walcott because they bring the whatever freight, whatever people wanted up in this area, they would bring it as far as Walcott on the train. And then he would go down with, these, with his freight wagon and he would pick up the freight and he would bring it back to Steamboat. And he hauled freight for FM Lights and Sons, and he hauled for Hughes Company, and there were several other establishments in town that he hauled freight for. Grandpa was also a carpenter, but there wasn't a whole lot of work in those days for carpenters, but whenever he could find work, that's what he did. But then he got the big idea that he was going to start raising sheep. And when he was in Iowa, he had had some experience with the herding law. And Colorado was proposing, was proposing passing the herding law. And one of the reasons they were going to do that is because the large cattle operations that used to bring lots of steers into this part of the country, they would just turn those steers loose and they would graze wherever they wanted to go. And they would eat off all the grass from the homesteaders. In fact, they ran a lot of homesteaders out of the country because the um, cattle would just come in and, and clean them out. Well, the cattlemen were very much opposed to this herding law. Even though my grandpa tried to explain um, what the herding law was, and in fact, he wrote an article for the paper explaining to people about how the herding law worked and how badly it was needed. Now, the cattlemen were so afraid that if this law passed, that they would have to start herding their cattle. But grandpa said in his article, no, why not just put up a fence? You wouldn't need to herd them, just put up fences. That would keep the cattle from running at large because they just turn these cattle out and because sheep fence is usually pretty short, the cattle would go right over the top of the fences and they'd eat up all of the grass from the sheep. Many of the homesteaders, like I said, were run out of the county because of the large cattlemen that came in with their large herds of cattle. And what they would do is they would bring them up from Texas uh, and they would bring them to this part of the country because the grass was so good, let them graze wherever they wanted all summer, and then they would take them back. They actually, I believe, took them to Kansas City and put them on the train and sold them. But that was one of the things that Grandpa was so much against was the large cattlemen that were coming in and, and taking away all the grass from the homesteaders that were already here. And the gist of Grandpa's article, it was an election year when he wrote the article, and he was trying to impress upon farmers and ranchers how important it was to get this herding law passed and that they should support candidates that were in favor of the herding law. And so he, he wanted to impress upon them that their vote really did count in this case. And eventually the herding law was passed. My grandpa had uh, uh, several hundred head of sheep and he had a forest permit he had a, a, a permit to run his sheep up on rabbit ears, up on Buffalo Pass, and on Service Creek. And of course, he had herders with him. They kept track of him. 
and uh, they spent their summers up on the forest and then they would bring them home in the back to the ranch in the winter before winter in the fall they bring them back and they would feed them hay all winter on the ranch and of course they would sell the lambs off of the ewes so they just have the ewes that they fed over the winter and uh, then they would have lambs of course the next year sometimes in a dry year like it is this year grass wasn't very good and hay wasn't very good and so they couldn't raise enough hay on the, the on the ranch to keep the sheep fed all winter so my daddy and my my dad and his brother john they used to haul hay from down along the Yampa River because they had irrigation along the Yampa River and there was always more hay down there. So they'd always take two teams of horses, two sleds, and they'd go down and get hay from down off of the river and take it home to feed the sheep. Those were long trips and they were mighty cold in the winter. But Daddy and his brother John were stout husky men and so they survived. They survived doing that. Now before World War I broke out, they started a new home on the ranch. And it was shortly after that that the war broke out, World War I broke out, and Daddy's brother Guy was called into the army. So he went into the army and he did his basic training and um, he was sent overseas to the Vernim Forest and he was sent over there to fight the war. He wasn't there very long before he was wounded and he ended up dying over there from his wounds. And one of the things that I've always found very interesting about that is that, of course, he was very lonely. He was away from his family. This was something that was all new and different to him. He had never been exposed to anything like this before. And so he wrote a lot of letters back home. He wrote to his, his mother often. But because those letters were coming from overseas, a number of them didn't get to her until after he had died. So when the letters came, she put them in a shoebox. And she never opened that shoebox. And when she passed away, that shoebox went to my dad and my mother. And they never opened it. And when they passed away, I inherited that shoebox and I did open it. And I almost felt guilty. I almost felt like I was intruding by doing that. But I not only opened the box, but many of the letters that was in that box had never been opened. My grandmother never read them. And Guy had told her about how he really knew why he was over there and that he had to fight for his country but that didn't mean he necessarily liked it and he really missed the family he missed the ranch he was always asking about how the harvest was going how the other kids were doing how the neighbors were doing so he never forgot about home but the thing I thought was interesting is that she never opened those letters now after he died, his body did not come back to the United States right away. It finally did, and there was a, a funeral held for him. And I've got pictures of that funeral. And I'm gonna tell you, I think everybody in Route County must have turned out for that funeral. I've got pictures of the wagon, that his coffin is on that's draped with a flag and pulled, of course, by a team of horses. And then there's a picture down Lincoln Avenue, Main Street, and it was full of people. 
just everybody came to that funeral. And of course, Guy is buried up at the Steamboat Cemetery. Believe it or not, my grandma was killed in a car wreck in 1928. She did get to live in her new house for a few years, but not very long. And the way the car wreck happened was she and my grandpa were headed somewhere, I assume into town, and they were in an either a Model A or a Model T, and those mostly were all old metal vehicles, and they had a car wreck with the uh, uh, mail carrier. And they did have a mail route at that time. They had a wreck with the mail carrier. And in the process of this wreck, my grandmother got a cut on her leg. And she was bleeding profusely, so they took her to the hospital. And she was, the, the wound was dressed and sewed up. And she was kept in the hospital overnight. So the next morning they got word to my grandpa that she was ready to come home and he could come and pick her up. So he got ready to come and pick her up. And when she got up and got dressed, she had a blood clot in her leg and it went to her heart and it stopped her heart from beating. And by the time grandpa got here, she had already passed away. Well, of course, my grandpa and all the kids were very distraught that she was gone. My grandpa started drinking pretty heavily. So my dad and his brother John, they decided they'd go into partnership and start running the ranch with grandpa. Well, in 1929, my mom came to visit her sister. Now her sister was my dad's closest neighbor. So lo and behold, my mom met my dad. She came in the fall and she came in 1929 in the fall and they were married in January of 1930. Now my mom's family home, she, my dad brought my mom to the family home and that's the home where I grew up and she was there with my dad of course, brother John and grandpa. So she cooked for all of them. But she came from Haxton, Colorado and her family were farmers also. But she was actually born in Wilbur, Nebraska. And they later moved to Haxton, Colorado. She was born in 1900. And uh, she was able to go to the eighth grade. And she wanted to go on to high school, which meant that they would have to go into town to go to high school. And Grandpa, her dad, said girls didn't need an education. There was no way that she was going to go on to school. So she never got to go to school beyond the eighth grade. And I think she always resented that a bit because she wanted to go on and become a teacher. But you know, in a way, it's a blessing that she didn't go to, get to go on to high school because I might not be sitting here today giving this presentation if she became a teacher. She may have never met my dad. Well, my mom and dad were blessed with four girls. I'm the youngest, and I came along very late in their lives. I guess you'd say I was a mistake. But anyway, I came along. And the story has it that my dad was so sure that because I came along so late in their lives that I just had to be a boy. He wanted a boy to take over the ranch and to help him with the ranching operation. So he was just sure he was going to be a boy. So my mom put in all of her garden on June the 2nd 
And on June the 3rd, she went into labor, and I was born early in the morning on June the 3rd. Now, I'm the only one of the four girls that were born in a hospital. All the rest of them were born at home, and Dr. Willett came and delivered the other three girls. The story goes, and I don't know if it's true or not, that when I was born, the doctor went out to my dad, who was in the sitting room waiting, and he told him, oh, you've got another beautiful baby girl. And my dad was very disappointed. And he was, he decided he was just going to go home. So he did. He got in the pickup and went home. But you know, he loved me just the same, whether I was a boy or a girl. He didn't care. He loved me anyway. But one of the things that he did do was I became his boy. I, from the time I was able to do anything outside, I was out there working beside him. I could run all kinds of machinery. I could harness horses. I could hitch him to a sled. I could bale hay. I could plant grain. I could do all of those things on the outside. I did some mechanical work. I learned a lot about the ranching operation from my dad. But do you know that when I got married, I could hardly boil water. I had never learned that side of a relationship. But I learned pretty quick. It didn't take me long to, to learn how to do that. Now all of us girls went to the Hilton Gulch School. That's the same place where my dad and his brothers and sisters went to school. And that schoolhouse is also still standing. It's a residence now, but it's still standing. But in those days, it's very poor roads. The roads were hard to gravel. And rarely were they ever plowed. So when we went to school, we went to school in the summer. We would start school about the end of March, and we always had a Thanksgiving program, and then that was the end of the school, until March again. Well, there was usually only about eight or ten kids in the school, and it, um, the teacher would teach f from grade one to grade eight. And there got to be less and less kids going to that school. It was harder to find a teacher to come in and teach. And so they decided they were going to close the Hilton Gulch School down. So they did. So when I was in the sixth grade, we consolidated into town school and we started being bused into the steamboat school. And I was in the sixth grade and our classroom was on the third floor of the school. And oh, what a shocker that was for me. First, the shock of riding the school bus to get to school. The second thing, going up to the third floor to the classroom and walking in, and here's 20 plus kids, none of whom I knew. Well, that was a that was a scary day for me. But the scariest part about it was in the middle of the afternoon on that first day, they decided to have a fire drill. So the fire whistle went off and we were all rushed out of the building and we had to go down three flights of stairs on the outside of the building. And it was those stairs that had the open, they were metal stairs and they were open and I'm scared to death of heights. So that was another, quite an experience for me that first day. But as I was going through school, one of the things that I learned fairly quickly is that most of the kids that were in my class had been going to school together for a long time, from the first grade on, especially the town kids. They had been together for quite some time. And so they all knew each other. And then the kids that lived up Elk River, they were bused into town sooner than we were. 
And so they also knew most of the kids and they had their own little groups. So it was hard for me to break into those groups and to make friends. And one of the things that I always said is I was born on the wrong side of the tracks because there was hardly anybody from my side of the county that was in my classroom. So I didn't know anybody, but I made friends and I did okay. And I graduated from Steamboat High School and went on to college. So it was okay. It turned out all right. But I think back on when I was growing up and what we really actually ever did in our leisure time. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, we didn't have much leisure time. We didn't have time to do much of anything else but work on the, on the ranch. We milk cows, and of course you had to milk them twice a day, so you couldn't be gone very long. But the one thing that the folks did insist upon was even though we didn't go to church, they took every Sunday off. And they, we always did something on Sunday. We either went fishing, we all loved to fish, or we'd just take a picnic lunch and we would go up Fish Creek Falls and have a picnic lunch and just spend a few hours there. We'd go to the hot springs, we went to the hot springs quite a bit or we just take a drive and um, just see new country. So the folks always insisted, unless we were in the hay and harvest or grain harvesting, we always took our Sundays off. Our, that was our one day of rest and relaxation. But one of the other things that I remember us doing is on Saturday nights, We'd all crawl in this old 1950 Chevy car we had, and we came to town. And we sat on the street, and we people watched. We'd sit by the theater, the chief theater was there, and we used to sit by the theater and watch the people go into the theater. But the thing that was interesting now that I think about it is, all the neighbors did the same thing. We all did that. We all came to town to watch people. And it was another good time for us to visit with the neighbors. So we'd all get together and visit on the street for a while, and then we'd go home. And there used to be square dancing on the street here in Steamboat. And so sometimes we'd join in with the square dancing. That was always a lot of fun. In the winter, of course, we didn't do that. But the way I spent my time in the winter was I did a lot of cross-country skiing. And I used to always like to go out rabbit hunting. You know, I'd like to, I like to, I never did. I don't believe I ever shot a rabbit, but that didn't mean I didn't like going. I used to like to go out and go, just go out cross-country skiing and seeing what I could see. We didn't have a TV. I never had a TV when I was growing up, but we did have a radio. And that was our way of keeping communication with the outside world. That was our only way that we had. And that radio was usually blaring away, regardless of what was on. And we used to listen to all of Gene Autry and all of those shows, but uh, it was usually on. The other thing that I remember about my youth that I've always enjoyed and I have some great memories of is my dad loved to hunt. And so he and I did a lot of hunting together. We did a lot of walking. We never were very successful, but we did a lot of deer hunting, a lot of elk hunting. And then we'd take off and go down to Craig and we'd go cottontail. We'd uh, hunt for rabbits. We'd go out there on the BLM land and we'd hunt for rabbits. That was always great fun. 
Well, as of today, I still operate my part of the ranch as a working operation. It's, uh, I use it for cattle grazing. I lease it out and people bring their cattle in and graze their cattle there. And one of the things that my folks impressed upon us girls is they never wanted that land to be developed. They didn't want it cut up into little pieces and have lots of little houses on it. And so far we've been fortunate enough to not have that happen. It makes it a little challenging though for my operation because I'm surrounded on three sides by subdivisions now with houses scattered all over. And the thing that makes it such a challenge is the people that move into those places, into the subdivisions, they usually don't have a clue about what a ranching operation is. They don't understand that cows will make a noise. Cows do smell. They live, leave big pies, cow pies. And on occasion, if the fences aren't good and grass gets a little short, they get out. But Colorado has a fence out law. And what that fence out law says is that if you don't want animals on your property, you fence them out. Well, first off, I don't think most of these people know how to build a fence. And second off, I don't think they'd do it if they did know how. But they can sure pick up the phone and call the sheriff whenever the cows get out. It's a challenge, but I enjoy it. And we work through it. We always manage to. But some of the traditions that I've tried to carry on from my grandparents and from my parents is I raise a big garden. I love having a big garden. Now there's only one of me, so I don't use much of what I raise, but I donate. I donate a lot of the produce that I grow. I donate it to Lift Up. I donate it to the Council on Aging. I give it away to the neighbors, and I give zucchinis to anybody that'll take them because I usually never get the number of plants just right to have just what I need. So I like to share, I like to share my, my uh, produce with people. But the other thing I like to share is I like to share the beauty and the serenity of my place. And so periodically I have people come out and I just drive them around the ranch so that they can see what it's like. And in fact, a couple of years ago, it was the greatest thing. We had two busloads of people come from the uh, uh, Council on Aging. The day that the cows came, we turned into the pastures. We took two buses out there and those people were able to watch those cows be unloaded and how they got together with their calves and how they got put into the pasture. And that was the neatest thing for some of those people because they'd never seen anything like that. They had no idea what that kind of an operation was. So I really enjoyed being able to share that with them. And I'm hoping that now that the pandemic is kind of waning and going away, that maybe we can do that again in the future. I'd like to. Uh, one of the things that I hope is that I never have to leave my property. It provides the peace and serenity that I so enjoy. Now I had a partner for 17 years and we built a, a log home on the property. And we finished it in 2005. But he passed away in 2017. And the one thing about him is he was just as crazy about antiques as I am. So if you come to my home, you're going to find a place full of antiques. 
I have lots of antiques from my grandparents, from my parents, and I buy a lot of antiques. So I have a house full of antiques. And I have two kids and they say to me constantly, Mom, what are you going to do with all this stuff? And I tell them, I'm not going to do a thing with it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to live here and I'm going to enjoy it. Because I do. I enjoy these things. But after I'm gone, what you do with it is your business. But I'm going to enjoy it while I'm here. So I just want to thank you for allowing me to share a little bit about my family's history and how they got to Route County. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that um, it'll give you somewhat of an idea of what life used to be like in the earlier years here in Route County and in Steamboat Springs. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. That, that was fantastic. I, I was there when you were talking about the two wagons, two horses, a mule, and seven, then eight kids. That was just wonderful. Oh, my. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, uh, you know, you're welcome to come to the ranch anytime you want to. I'd be happy to show it to you. So. I think that might be a plan we yes. have to make. Thank yes. you. Yes, you're Thank welcome. You. Okay, let's see, to stop, I think, I just...